please help me in welcoming Mr. Phil Jerry. All right, like you said, my name is Phil Jerdy. Uh, together with our family, we live at our suburban Reba, right between Bison and Buffalo, South Dakota, in the northwest corner. Uh, we titled this "Using Buffalo to Grow Cattle," or "Using Buffalo Cattle to Grow Prairie," and specifically, uh, we're going to talk more today about uh, actually using livestock to heal land. I like to say that we raise buffalo cattle kids, not necessarily in that order. Here we are mowing the lawn. The, the lawn is a 10 acre or so uh, pasture. And once, once a year or so, we'll run the buffalo right through the, through the yard. Our cattle are mostly uh, Scottish Highland. Scottish Highland Cross. A lot of people talk that they want, you know, a good beef by cow that can handle winter and not a lot of extra inputs. Well, that's, you know, that's, that's their natural body type, shorter and thicker. Um, we, we cross them up generally with Angus, but uh, we've got some other crossbreds too. Maintain that, that thicker, deeper body type. These are some of our crossbred Norwegians. They're a different body type, taller and thinner, real level headed. They drew a lot of both sides of the mouth. Here's our family. Since that picture was taken, we've added number 10. We're happy to, to welcome Quilla to the family. Here's my wife, Jill. Good looking gal. Excuse me. Hello. Yeah, Jill. Piled order. Yep. Uh, thanks. I'll uh, I'll shut it off. Bye. I want to remind you to shut the phone up. <laughs> it was the worst man-made ecological disaster in American history. Encouraged by federal policies, thousands of settlers moved west and plowed more than 5 million acres of native grasslands to grow wheat. Record-setting droughts had catastrophic consequences because there was no grass to protect the fragile soil. The Dust Bowl tore the Great Plains apart and sent our economy deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we're reliving the past as we watch one of the world's last intact grasslands fall to plows and federal policies like the Farm Bill. Between 2008 and 2011, 23 million acres of America's ranchland and native habitats, an area bigger than the state of Maine, were converted to cropland. We're setting the stage for another dust bowl, and your tax dollars are paying for it. Now it's pretty scary, or concerning at least. Um, I, I borrowed this or stole it from a guy named David Montgomery. I'm going to plug his book later, so I don't think he'll have a problem. A guy named Stephen Covey in the, in the Seven Secrets of Successful People writes about the circle of concern which is everything that we're concerned about, as opposed to the circle of influence, which is much smaller. And when we spend too much of our time out in this circle, you know, we take away from time that we can be spending influencing things that we can. So we're going to go in and out of those both the circles today. We've been uh, somewhat holistically plant grazing for about 10 years now. It's definitely a book I would recommend. That's uh, Save Resolistic Management. This bare ground, this is bare ground on our ranch, about a, a square yard of it. 
Bear Ground is enemy number one. Uh, I'd like to think that there should be a support group for people like me <laughs> who admit that they have a bear ground problem. <laughs> you know, like they would meet once a month or something and, and uh, sit down. My name is Phil. Hi, Phil. I have a bear ground problem. <laughs> Because really, admitting you have a problem is the first step to recovery. And we'll talk a significant about, uh, amount about recovery today, too. And uh, really, I need to take responsibility for it. You know, these roots laying on top of the soil that's being washed away and blown away, those are oxidizing under my watch. And realize that how I manage determines my susceptibility to drought. You know, this this yard of soil is going to go through multiple droughts every year. It's going to go through multiple floods because the water can't get in and penetrate into the soil. And in the summertime, it's going to be 130 degrees on that soil surface. Savory writes about the four ecosystem processes, which are water cycle, mineral cycle, community dynamics, or in other words, diversity for that, and energy flow. Energy flow meaning do we have lots of solar panels out there to, to capture that free solar energy. It's a good example of, of diversity and also a mineral cycle. These plants are, are bringing up minerals from deep in the, in the soil uh, and making them available for plants. That little guy over there, that's your yard. Gives you an idea of the soil, the root depth of, of shallow plants. Or when we graze our plants shallow and we keep them short, we also keep our root system short. Uh, they say that in a, in a healthy handful of soil, there's like a billion of these soil critters. But when we have bare ground, we have too hot for them, too dry for them, too cold for them. And we just don't have the diversity of the soil critters that we need. Of course, this is showing diversity. We've got a Canadian, Neil Dennis here. This was on a pasture walk at our place a few years ago. Um, we've got, we got uh, of course, different body types. We've got thinner and then maybe a more mature. <laughs> we've got you here and, and uh, more mature that's our friend from Eclatina and he's here today too energy flow this is late summertime and which, which side of the fence is actually capturing the solar energy <coughs> So we've got a, a bunch of different tools that we can pick from. We're using combination. Uh, first being, we're using our brain, uh, money and labor, recovery. I would argue that we're very good at using, you know, we're working hard and we spend a lot of money. Recovery, we don't really use that one at all conventionally. Animal impact is the big one. Animal impact and recovery are the two big ones that we're going to talk about. Technology, you know, I'm a recovering AI person. And I used to spend my summers breeding these silly cows, thinking I could do a better job than the bull can. But I'm over it. It's, it's a process. And fire, I, Savory includes fire as a tool. You know, it should, it should be there, at least in you know, brittle, lower rainfall environments. So I'm going to take it off there. So a lot of ranchers, you know, you ask them why you do something a certain way. Well, that's the way we've always done it. That's the way granddaddy did it. That's the way great granddaddy did it. 
I'm not sure that's good enough. We need to be testing the tools that we're using to see if it's the right tool for the job. For example, here's a tool. Obviously, you put the tobacco in and, and light it up, and then you would blow the smoke in the rear end, and that was, you know, it was going to be healing. Okay, so just because somebody's great grandpa used this tool doesn't make it the appropriate tool for the job. And so I'm not here to blow smoke up anymore. Now I'm going to tell you what works for us and what doesn't. This is just an example of, we've got 130 different <coughs> permanent paddocks, which we've overbuilt our fence, but that's, that's another topic. Um, but they average about 100 acres apiece. And so wherever we could get a water source, either a surface water or, or a well water, we put in a paddock. And uh, it's just a matter of, <coughs> we impact once we get everything into one herd, we're only impacting less than 1% of the ranch at any one time. So if we're on three, four, five day moves, um, where we're headed with this is, is a two year recovery period. Which I think will basically drop through the ranch. Uh, we just move open, open the gate and move them to the joining paddock. Now when we do this, I like to have at least two know, good people to help move. Sometimes we're moving 1,600 animals. A lot of times it's, it's Quilla and Vigo. So. <laughs> and you want them eager if they're going to help you. You want people that are energetic and ready to jump in with you. And sometimes just two of them.
scratching my head, you know, what's going on? There must be something I'm missing. And I think it is in our more brittle areas, we just don't have the massive vegetation. That's not our weak link, is having too much stuff. So, animal impact must be something more. And then we started looking at the effects of the urine and manure. And that's more what I want to see. This is this is a little tense because obviously I probably left them in there a day too long. But uh, it's this way across the whole pasture. You know, if any particular yard of soil is not impacted with either urine or manure this year, it will be two years from now, statistically. Where this is a, a neighbor and enjoys what he's doing, I'm not criticizing him. But any particular yard in there, it may be 100 years before it gets uh, impacted with either urine or manure. Just based on how we manage. And this is exactly how I would manage. This, I was really good at that. I would spend all summer putting up hay, and then I would move the hay to a different location, and then I would feed the hay in that different location. Well, what I was really doing Oh, and then I would also, I was good at dragging stuff in the springtime too, so I could oxidize my nerve. But the point, point was we gathered all these minerals from other parts of the ranch and transported them all over here. And to me, that's not a land manager's job, that's a miner's job to move minerals around. For example, I found this statistic. Each cow is producing 13.7 tons of manure per year, along with all, a whole bunch of different minerals, and nitrogen, and everything else. Well, a simple math for a ranch would be a big number of tons of manure, 13.7 tons of manure. Equate that to semi load something we can think of. That's 548 semi load fertilizer. Well, one thing farmers do well, and I'm not criticize farmers today too, but they do well is they spread out their fertilizer. They don't buy in their fertilizer and dump it in one spot. They spread it out. Here's a move. We just moved them from right to left. This is the first of November this year. You can see lots of leafy green. Cool season grasses, along with, with a significant amount of, of older grass. And then about four days later, they've done a good job of consuming. Even in November, we're seeing some regrowth where they just came out of. And finally, we're out of there. Now, what would conventional management tell you? Well, Phil, you overgrazed it. I'm just saying, no, I didn't overgraze overgrazed plant and you only expose it to grazing four days a year. But they'd also say, man, you better, you left that manure all over you. you. Better get a drag and oxidize that manure. Now I saw this in a magazine. There, one of these farm magazines that want to separate you from your money. And I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. This is a book. <laughs> This is a, a manure vacuum that I can spend money on. I can go around and I can eliminate waste damaging effect on ground cover. Now, I just told you that the number one thing I can do in terms of animal impact is get urine and manure distributed equally on the ground. And these guys want you to spend money removing that. I think John Wayne said it well. <laughs> <laughs> And that's true. How many guys use electric fence? Are there any electric fence folks? I got one of these testers. I used to just short it out to see if the fence was working. I got one of these testers. What an amazing tool. You go up the fence, and it, it, if you have a problem, it tells you which direction the problem is and what amount of problem you have. I've even got, I've even got one now. I haven't used it yet, but you can remotely shut the fence off, fix it, whatever you're going to do, turn it back on. You don't have to run back two miles to the fence. 
Anyway, I got me thinking we need something like that to carry in our pocket. It's like a, a BS monitor so that when stuff is presented to us as the in fact, you know, I want to sell you this vacuum, the mirror vacuum, I want to sell you these extra uh, molasses barrels made out of urea, you know, or even a, a cell phone app, you know, that would just start beeping like, you can keep your insurance plan if you like your insurance plan. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because a lie is still a lie. <coughs> Everyone believes it. And truth is still truth, even if no one knows. There's people that say that we can all have our different versions of truth. And that's. Beep, beep, beep. Rest is not recovery. You know, Uncle Steve is laying over here resting in a wooden box, lid on it. Okay, so is he, in, he's certainly at rest, but he's not recovering. So how do we maximize the recovery time? And that's easy, you minimize the number of hertz, in fact, get it to one. And that's, I know that's a hard step. I, I, when I finally put them all together, I did it early one morning where the neighbors saw it. And that, that helps. I'll be there for you. There are more brittle curves. Like I said, the two-year recovery period is where we need to be. This example, I think this picture has all the perfect parts of what we're trying to do. We have bare ground. We have some animal impact. We have just a little bit of litter enough to really do much with, but we've also got these seeds laying around on the ground. And what this critter did by stepping here was make good seed to soil contact. It gave made a depression there for some extra water to cool. So when that new plant does start growing, it has a little dab extra moisture, maybe a little bit of shadow there to keep, keep it a little bit cooler. And I call that stage one animal impact. Stage one animal impact is a little easier to get when you have a little bit of moisture on the ground. But obviously we don't have that all the time. Now here's stage two. Recovery mode. And I don't know whether you guys have that, but we have this wonderful thing. It's, I think it's called Russian thistle. And that thing will burrow down through bare ground that nothing else will touch. Well, that's, that's making the, the, the pathway, the root pathway for all your other plants and, and little bugs and everything else that eventually recover that bare ground. So that is really a blessing for us. Now, any rancher knows that this is way better than this, right? Not your heads. Keep your eye on these photo points in the trees. So over the winter of 09, we, we made a treatment, and, and this is 10. And, and we've got some weeds growing. We've got some thistle growing. And, and maybe a rancher would say, well, I'd still uh, spray it. I'd rather have the grass spots than the weeds. But you give it more recovery time. Suddenly, our bare spots are western wheatgrass. Now, as ranchers, we prefer western wheatgrass to very short cutting. I'm going, to, I'm going to argue that we do. These, this was back at a time when I didn't use a lot of my brain and I didn't take pictures, but. These were hard pans that were big enough that I could park my pickup in and not be on any grass. And the neat thing is, with, with recovery time, you know, our major plants in here are invading species as alfalfa. That's what these bushy plants are here. Here's one of those alfalfa plants. It's still where I cut it off, it was 
that edge of a dam that washed out, it's still as big around as my middle finger. So I don't know, it may go down another 10 feet after this. But that guy is bringing up a lot of minerals. This is on a late, late Friday night, end of June. Uh, it's one of our smaller paddocks. It's only about 15 acres. We dump the whole herd in there. Sunday morning, take them out. We've impacted the whole place, or the whole pasture pretty evenly. Left plenty of, of cover, I guess. And now, now, at least near long recovery, and I'm gonna advocate going too. We've seen a big comeback of, of warm season grass, and this one in particular, well, there's some switch grass and whatnot in, in front, but this is that tall stuff is prairie core grass, which the book says you know is of little value to livestock. Well, so we put the buffalo and cattle in, and, and lo and behold, that's one of the first things they selected for. Well, I don't know what, why. But potentially, those roots are going down 10 feet in the ground, and they're bringing up some mineral that those animals are lacking. I don't know. Here's an example of animal impact. It's again, it's a 100-acre pasture. We left the animals in there for five, six days. And, and I was kind of embarrassed to even take the picture, because it just totally destroyed that stream bank. Luckily, it wasn't by the road, so nobody could see it. But, but I took the picture anyway. Obviously, it needs recovery. So 60 days later, I went out to take a look at it. And where we made the most destruction is where we get the most recovery. Now, the question is, is it, is it fully recovered? I don't think so. I think you're going to have to wait a year to two years. Err on the side of too much recovery. But let's say you're still not happy. You know, say, Phil, this edge right in here is still too steep. What tool would I use to smash down the stream bank that I'm not happy with? Hoot. Anybody? Hoot. And one pack. Thank you. <laughs> Soils are number one export. That's where I was going with this. Soils are number one export. 
here's a couple guys out here showing you the scale of it. I don't know if they made it through the flood there or if they came there later, but this is down in Missouri. Obviously a significant amount of water, and that's North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana's fault. If you think back, you know, that we didn't put our water in our soil and in our plants. We dumped it all on them. Some things to note here is the plow line. See, all the topsoil has, has eroded off of there with the water, but this plow line, or the tillage line, that's what they call it, it's like a hard pan underneath the soil. And that was hard enough to, to retain a lot of these pieces where this stuff is all loose. So where are the roots? There are no roots down here because the, the, the plants can't get through that capped soil. In this case, the capped soil is underneath the top soil. If you notice over here, <coughs> that top soil is still in place because the trees have, have drilled down through it and they're holding the soil. Now this is USDA stuff. I mean, I, I come down hard, hard on government guys too. I know there's a lot of them here today, and that's okay. Um, but they, they talk about soil loss tolerance. Um, how much soil loss is tolerable on your place called ground? Zero. Zero. Or negative one? How about negative one to negative five be our soil loss, loss tolerances? Tons per acre. Fortunately, the guy had federal crop insurance, so all is well. But you know, this blowing dirt stuff, that's, that's way long time ago. No, that's this last spring. And see, this is just the heavier stuff that blew up. The lighter organic matter, the lighter part, is that all blew away. But it may sound like I'm picking on farmers in the end, but I'm an equal opportunity bare ground erosion uh, disliker. <laughs> because obviously this is pasture land and it's eroding, uh, particularly through water, but you know, in our country, I think wind blows away as much soil as, as water. So, on average, if you include all the grazing land and all the cropland, we're losing three tons of topsoil per acre per year. But fortunately, that's tolerable, I guess. This Jared Diamond wrote a book, and, and I would recommend this book. Um, and he writes about how, how societies fail. And once in a while, there's, there's some that succeed, but they share these five traits. One, their land is, is erodible, which we just watched pictures of. They experience hotter, drier, cooler, wetter, some type of change. Their economy relies on trade. Their friendly nations become unfriendly nations. They're trading partners. And then they respond poorly to their environmental conditions. Think tolerable soil loss. Oh, yeah. Tolerable soil loss is like tolerable amount of alcohol to put in your <coughs> lung before you fly. What? <laughs> this is a book I'm reading right now. This is that book I told you I plugged, David Montgomery. And uh, he's, he, he does the math. He figures that over the course of human history, civilizations lose 0.7% uh, so almost 1% of their soil each year, which is why civilizations tend to last 100, 150 years up to about 500. As soon as they go through their soil, they either have to move on to new territory or die out. 
Now this is right out of his book too. You know, it would have taken a long time for a hunter-gatherer society to move this dirt. But obviously, that soil is going to come down rapidly. He's going to need some insurance. Now this is right out of the USDA, so we can trust it. They dump, this is their numbers, they dump a truckload of soil per second into the Gulf. So I'm a math guy. 60 per minute, 3,600 truckloads per hour, big number per day, and an even bigger number per year. Clearly, soils are number one export. But there's a wise man that once said, King Solomon, is there anything of which it may be said? See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. These other civilizations that collapsed went through the same steps. This is this was formed. This is in Libya. This was formerly known as the bread basket of Rome. You know, when I can conceive, you know, some Roman generals, centurions, visiting with the farmers in charge there about their gullies that are forming and their and their dust storms that they're having. Talking about tolerable soil loss. Here's a, kind of a this this part of the ranch we bought about ten years ago. And this is outside of the ranch, but you can see that this was uh, season-long grazing, and just summer grass country, and the results are the same. Now the next two pictures I'm going to show you. The first I'm going to be standing here shooting this way, and here shooting this way. We see a lot of, of woody plants that aren't preferred by the livestock. Safe right? And I'm just going to turn it. And I'm stocking heavier on my side of the fence. And again, these guys are happy doing what they're doing. I'm fine with that. But when we manage differently, we can expect different results. All these yellows, and this is uh, January, all these yellows and reds and Pinks and stuff. Those are all warm season plants. So now, when we bought this property, they, this this was a picture taken uh, before we bought the property. But it was this rectangular piece, five six acres, whatever, and it was rectangular bare ground. And as far as I remember, this was just a big summer pasture. So what's going on? Why is there bare ground in rectangular shapes? Yeah, I'll maintain that that's, that's the homesteader's original plot that he plot up. He lost, he lost his organic matter. <coughs> Maybe it was only plowed up in a couple, three years, I don't know. But there's no evidence, um, any evidence that anyone that I know of remembers of anybody farming. So, I'm going to take a picture. We had a four inch rainfall event at the end of August. And uh, it was in an hour's time on this property. And I'm going to take a picture right here, looking straight south along the fence. And then I'm going to turn and take a picture out into this. And that water was running fast enough that it brought debris up on the first and second layer of the fence. Now I'm going to turn out into our bare ground. And it didn't make it very far before there's so much vegetation there that it slowed the water down enough to deposit the soil. Xavier talks about you know, any water that leaves your place, you want it to be clean enough that you can just go take a drink out of it. Thing. There's this big dam here that backs up water. Clear up here, it must be 15 acres of water it backs up. And so, uh, well, this will be a good test. Let's go over and see if this dam has water. Now, where I'm standing would normally be in, in the underwater. 
be in the spillway right here. This whole area is flooded, but it's full. And all we had was a little bit of water in the bottom. And the reason that happened was because the drop of water when it came and hit the soil. Here's two of my boys standing in a draw, just not very far away from, from the dam upstream. But it's incredibly hard for water to get moving when it runs into all this grass in the road. So if we don't change the way we think, the way we manage, we're not going to change our soil. Here we are, this is January 15th of this year. And that was that, we were getting North Dakota kind of cold at that time. But we've got green grass down in that thick cover of older grass. Now, would I get kicked out of here if I argue that the green season is any time we can feed leafy green grass to our animals? I don't think so. I mean, it's not like that their whole diet is green grass, but that's pretty good feed. It's because the ground cover is acting as an insulation. Our ground is warming up earlier in the spring. It's staying warm later in the fall. It's staying cooler in the summertime. So, is there anybody familiar with BRICS testing in here? <coughs> BRICS testing is a measure of, basically a measure of energy. It may have something to do with minerals too, but it's a measure of the energy in your grass. So, a couple of the kids decided it was a nice day to BRICS test. result is somewhere around 16. Now there's a lot of areas in the country that during the peak of their growing season aren't going to measure 16 on their energy level. Here we are feeding that middle winter. It's our unfair advantage. And we need to use it. Here's a friend of mine, Chad Peterson from Nebraska, and this is just kind of a typical model of how these warm seasons have come in. This is several years ago now, but um, this big blue stem and switchgrass. And actually now it's, it's crawled up above the bottoms and draws it up onto the flats now. He talks about the Fab Five warm season grasses, and these are all grasses that have big wide leaves on them. Huge root systems. Here's some more warm seasons, prairie sand reed and, and big blue and little blue. That has expanded from just a little spot. Now it's taken up, this one spot has turned into a half an acre. Here's switchgrass. This is, uh, this was just a patch of buckrush. That's what we call it. Snowberry. But anyway, here is switchgrass showing up right in the middle of the buckrush patch when we get out of recovery time. And the rule of thumb is warm seasons produce twice the more, twice the amount of forage on half the moisture. So what a phenomenal plant or set of plants to have in an environment that typically gets warm and dry in July and August. Or sometimes April through August or longer. There's a guy on tour from England that was over but I just wanted to point out that here the warm season, this is the end of July or early August, and they've crawled up on top above all the draws now. Big, wide, leafy things. To me, that's exciting. You see ranches advertised in our country, and they'll advertise them that, that boy, we're in the heart of short grass country. Does that look like short grass country? We're a cool season grass country. I don't think so. I can see that we had, when they say cool grass country, what they're really saying is, is that we grazed out the warm seasons, we have cool season but If you go to other parts of the country where they say warm season country, what they really mean is they graze out the short, or they graze out the cool season. So here's my son Beagle, he just turned three. 
piece we're discussing the bare ground foreground as if as opposed to the grass mine. But a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, rather, because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with them. Now, he doesn't know that this is cool season country. This is the part of the ranch that we finally got cross fenced up and used our, our first treatment in the winter of 09. And the next year, right in amongst the thistles and weeds and whatnot that had previously dominated this, uh, all these little red plants start showing up, which are, which is big busa. And a year later, those little plants are mature, seeding themselves. I meant to take another picture of it this October, and then we got that three feet of snow dumped on it. I never made it out there. Here's a, an example of, of set stock grazing. Turn the cattle out and spray. Uh, versus our plain grazing. We're running a lot more ahead on our side of the fence, probably <coughs> double or triple the stocking rate. Um, the thing notice all these leggings, these are all alfalfa plants, falcata alfalfa. And how how symbiotic that relationship is. Notice how rich and dark grass is compared to right across the fence. These plants are denser with minerals because of the diversity. Across much of the ranch to South Alpha is over 50% of the forage. Now if I ever thought it was a problem, which I don't, I think there's going to be some big warm season grasses and use up all this extra nitrogen. Uh, but if there ever was a problem, what would I do to get alfalfa out? I could hay it. I used to do that. If I repeatedly hay, a, hay an alfalfa field, eventually I'll hay the alfalfa out. Here's some new seedings. I'm not a farmer, but is that a pretty good stand for a new seeding? use an animal impact. So I'll advocate managing for what you want. A set stop versus planned grazing. Of course we've got some wildlife. We've got trumpeter swans that have to come and nest every year now. And the most amazing critters Pesticides are toxic to all these critters. Here's a move. I'm just showing up to open the gate here. And the buffalo are coming and the cattle are coming. And, but way more than any livestock for these birds. The picture doesn't do it justice because there are just thousands of them circling the herd. So we end up moving way more birds than we ever do livestock. I was showing this in Baker last year, and I talked about dung beetles. We end up moving way more dung beetles than we do the, the birds eat. <coughs> Some paths you can open them up, and there are literally hundreds of dung beetles in a path, which is probably why the birds are being attracted there. Those are our most common ones, these little red ones. When you open it up, they just freeze. Way. These are bigger ones than smoke. <laughs> Get the picture. Just, we just moved through this pasture rapidly. We weren't in there very long. We were on a mission to get to the other side of the ranch. But a couple days after the herd was in there, I got up early one morning, which is unusual. Um, but look at all these spiders. <laughs> And I maintain that's a pretty tough place for a fly to get going. <coughs> this, of course, is that uh, ship that was down to study in the 
in the Antarctica as much as scientists who meet well. Um, and they ran into Al Gore and got stuck in the ice. They were studying, <laughs> they were studying um, that the ice was going away. I mean, anywhere Al Gore shows up, you can guarantee it's going to be cold, it's going to be a blizzard or something. They mean well. Um, and I want to bring up this issue of givers or takers. You know, have you ever been in a room and somebody walks in and just drains the energy out of the room? As opposed to somebody else who walks in the room and just lights up the room with energy. Um, you know, Al Gore flying his jet plane to lecture me about driving my SUV is, is a hypocritical, a hypocritical pass. So here's a guy, again, I don't know if this is we do, what it is. Um, but he, look how close he is having to hold that to see if, what the roots are. You know, these plants were developed from native plants. And as we put our energy or our genetic selection on making this part better, it happens at the expense of this. So when it comes to building organic matter, your root size matters. We're not going to build a substantial amount of organic matter with little tiny root systems. We need those native deep-rooted plants. So obviously this plant is a taker. The question, why do the experts only measure organic matter in the top foot? They're out there testing the wheat field, they're out there testing the corn field, whatever it is. Because that's where all the roots are. Notice how deep the roots are here. I drew this line in here at eight feet. Now, if we take the same plants and maintain them at, at, at a short height, obviously our root system is going to be shorter also, substantially shorter. <clears throat> but notice how, I mean, they're, they're thick all the way down. So how do you quantify these results? Well, using the, 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 the climate change people's own data, here's Bismarck Man data, for example. Population 100,000, this is easy math. The carbon footprint per person, what they tell us, what we're, what we're putting into our heat and our cars and everything else, coal plants, is 20 tons per year per person across the country. So the total Bismarck Mandan carbon footprint is, would be 2 million tons. Now they tell us that a percent change, 1% change in organic matter, either way, is, is equivalent to 8.6 tons. Carbon. So the math is pretty easy. I'm going to take this off of uh, Gabe and Paul Brown's ranch because they gave me their data and I haven't done the data on our ranch. But so they've changed their organic matter by 4%. They can go show you their results. Times 8.6 tons of carbon. And they're doing it over a depth of at least four feet into the soil on a thousand acres of their cropland pretty big number of sequestered carbon. Now let's look at their pasture land. Their result is significantly higher in their pasture land than in their crop land because there's so much more diversity in their pasture land. But I gave them the same 4% increase. So 4% increase times the 8.6 tons of carbon per acre times, but I'm going to go 8 feet down now because we saw that those roots or at least eight feet deep. Over 3,000 acres, you get even a much bigger number. So the total carbon sequestered on the Brown Ranch, by my calculation, is almost half of the total output of Bismarck Mandan. What, if this was real, um, all we need to do is, you know, get Gabe and Paul another 4,000 acres of, of lease crop, conventional crop ground, and the whole problem goes away. Of course, it's baloney because they're not counting the soil loss, the carbon in the soil loss at three 
tons per acre across however many hundreds of millions of acres there are. <coughs> Learning states, I want to focus on animal performance first. Uh, depleted soils do not lead animal performance. I mean my like cropland and hayland. Don't expect them to be <coughs> your best producing mineralized soils because you've mined them for how many years? Use them for winter time. Here's our bale grazing. There's lots of people that know how to bale graze. We just bale, put enough twine to dump them out of the baler, and uh, turn them off over. I don't monkey with the fences and stuff. This guy noticed that uh, <coughs> Maynard Murray, that the minerals in the sea were the ex exact proportion that we needed in our, our croplands. He, he recognized cropland depleted cropland 60 years ago. So he'd spread these out at 10,000 pounds per acre with a control. They got heavier yields, then he fed it to livestock, couldn't get the livestock to get sick. He should have been a secretary of agriculture. So manage for what you want, not for what you don't want. Is this managing for what we want or for what we don't want? You know, we based our food system around an indiscriminate killer. We consume the stuff that an indiscriminate killer won't kill. Does that make any sense? One of the things is that it inhibits the absorption of the minerals. When we feed Roundup for two years, we have problems. This is a French study. So the world is producing more food than ever before, but less nutrient dense than ever before, because our soils are so lack are so depleted. So what would be an indicator that what I just told you is true? Well, one indicator is, you know, we eat to feel full. If, we, if our food doesn't have nutrition in it, we don't know when to shut down eating. He, he wants to feel full. What we're doing to our kids is criminal. We've got, we got adult onset diabetes is one of the biggest growing problems in our grade school kids. You know, there could be a class action suit brought by American people because we've been telling them we're, we're giving you food. We're in actuality, we've been giving them a bunch of empty calories. But we can't have our land healed. So when's a good time to start healing the land? Let's not be like these two guys. <laughs> <laughs> She's a great example. Look, they bared off their soil. They've got one little snack left, and the sea levels are rising. When's a good time to start? How about today? Plato had this thing figured out over 2,000 years ago. Those who are able to see beyond the shadows and lies of their culture will never be understood, let alone believed by the masses. So don't expect to be popular when you're healing land. People who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do. So thank you. We have a short, can I do that? We have a short music video that the kids put together. I asked them to get it going here a month ago, but they waited until last week, which is kind of when I waited to get my part ready. <laughs> Just look at that body. Just look at that. 
that body. Just look at that body. I could work out. What? Just look at that body. Just look at that body. Just look at that body. I could work out. What? I look across the land. Oh, this is what I see. Uh -huh. You're all in me.